Good afternoon. Thank you for standing by. I'd like to inform all participants that today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. You've been placed in listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's call. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1, and please make sure that your phone is unmuted and record your name clearly when prompted. Thank you, and you may begin with your host, Ms. Nicola Dada. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us in this second installment of our third Thursday's Community College Webinar Series. Today, we will focus on financial education resources for young people. My name is Bukola Dada. I work at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in the Office of Students as an Outreach Specialist. We have five great speakers lined up today. From Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, we'll hear from Mina Bon, Lasan Anfune. We'll also hear from Jen Smith from the Department of Labor, Rachel Strawn from Virginia Community College System, and Aaron Kelly with Virginia Department of Social Services. Before we get started, I have to give our legal disclaimer as an employee of the CFPB. This presentation does not constitute legal interpretation, guidance, or advice of CFPB. Any opinions or views stated by the presenter are the presenter's own and may not represent the Bureau's views. We are not affiliated with and do not endorse any of the speakers or entities participating in today's presentation. With that being said, I will turn things over to our first presenter, Mina Bond. Thank you, Bukola. Hi, everyone. My name is Mina Bond, and I am the Senior Policy and Innovation Advisor in our Office of Financial Education. I'm one of the, we are one of the five offices that's part of the Consumer Education and Engagement Division, and you'll hear more from some of our other colleagues. But today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about our work around youth financial capability, particularly in the evidence and practice space. Um, next slide. Uh, so before I begin, I just want to take a step back and explain to you our Bureau strategy for youth financial education. It really breaks down to three different channels. One is around evidence, which is providing the research data ideas for uh, capturing metrics. The other is practice, and this means programs and resources to support those that are actually providing youth financial education. You may think of these as um, teachers or yourselves if you're in community colleges. And the other is for uh, parents and tools for parents and caregivers. So ways to reach younger kids probably in the three to uh, 13 year age uh, with some materials on how to begin financial education at an early age. So oh, next slide. So I'm gonna begin by talking about some of our evidence work. Next slide. Uh, and, and to really get that started, I want to root it in how we approach our evidence work, which is that we believe that there are building blocks to youth financial capability and that these building blocks layer over time. So there's ways to incorporate financial capability starting at a very young age. So, for example, in early childhood, um, you can focus on executive function, and these are things like self-control, uh, self-perseverance, planning, problem solving problem solving. In middle childhood, we found that um, you can focus on financial habits and norms, and these are rules of thumbs. This is also when um, your peer effects are really important to you, what your friends are doing, what you're seeing from your parents. And then uh, as you're approaching adolescence and young adulthood, you can start to incorporate financial knowledge and decision-making skills. So this is the ability to say, hey, you know, if I'm planning to buy a cell phone, how can I conduct research to see what's the best plan for me or thinking about ways to finance your purchases. So using our building blocks, we really help uh, root the rest of our research and evidence around this. I think this makes it easier for folks to think about, you know, if I'm engaging with different age groups, what is it that I can focus on if I'm a program leader? Next slide. So the next step that we took, uh, the building blocks, is actually to create a measurement guide. We've heard a lot from uh, program leaders and practitioners that while you have really amazing programs, how do you know that these are effective practices for the uh, audience that you're serving? How do you know that you're helping them achieve the objectives that you set out to? So our measurement guide is an attempt to provide stakeholders with a means of assessing young people's progress towards the achievement of building blocks which I talked about earlier, uh, which are executive function, habits and norms, and financial knowledge and decision making. 
And a number of stakeholders can use this measurement guides, anybody from youth program leaders to researchers to education policy leaders. And this measurement guide will allow you to be able to track uh, your participants or students' progress over time and provide you evidence about your uh, curriculum strength or opportunities to, for refinement. It also helps us deepen the understanding of youth financial capability and how that leads into adult financial well-being. Next slide. So I want to take a moment to go through our uh, measurement guide and how to use it. And before I um, continue on, I just want to say that all of the materials that I'm going to be talking about today and the reports that I have are available on our website, uh, which I'll talk about later on at the end. They're available for free download as well. So for the measurement guide, it begins with an introduction to the building blocks of financial capability, which I quickly went through. And then it talks about suggestions on how to assess uh, the progress towards the de uh, development of the building blocks. So for example, it breaks it out by different age group. And I'm going to say, let's say I'm working with teenagers. And, it, and you can see here on this slide that on the left side, there's the building blocks, executive function, financial habits and norms, and financial decision, uh, financial knowledge and decision making skills. And then there, on the right side, you see the associated questions with it. These are the, these are the program metrics in which you're trying to measure as an as a implementer. So I'm going to say that if I am working with a group of teenagers, I want to be able to increase their financial knowledge and decision-making skills. And specifically, I want to make sure that they're able to identify trusted sources of information. You can see that, that red arrow is pointing to that question there. The next set of tables basically shows you that for, for um, the financial knowledge and decision-making skills building block, here are the synthetic measures that you can, you can use. So for whether or not an adult can identify trusted sources of information, we see two specific studies that will help you be able to do this. Next slide. So once you click on that, it actually brings you to the different studies. This one is a cognitive reflection test. It, and each study, we break it out by telling you what is the building block that we're trying to measure for which age group, what is the milestone, in this case, can the young adult identify trusted sources of information, the format of the measurement, who it is completed by, and then additional background and testing information. So this is just one of the measurements that I'm showing you as an example, but we have many, many more in the measurement guide. They are, uh, there are measurements that are surveys, uh, task exercises, interview questions, and more. Next slide. And so we hope you'll be able to utilize this measurement guide to look at your own programs, but also use this as a way to think about how to refine your programs as well. The next thing that I wanted to talk about is a resource that we've developed uh, called A Guide for Advancing K-12 Financial Education. Next slide. This guide was originally aimed at um, pro, uh, state and policy makers who want to bring financial education into their states but may not know where to start or um, how to expand their programs. But we actually found that this guide is also really useful for anybody in this financial education, state, uh, education space, whether you're a community college leader or a teacher or a financial education practitioner. If you're just looking to increase financial education in your state, this kind of gives you a roadmap on how to do it. Um, we have the, the, you can think of this almost as a resource guide that's broken out into three different sections. One is laying the groundwork, so how do you get momentum and excitement for advancing K-12 financial education? Then the second, um, second section is related to actually building the initiative, so how do you identify partners to bring to the table? And then the last section is really focused on extending the impact, so once you have a program, how do you collect metrics for it or deepen the engagement? And so within each one of these sections, there's different uh, different topics that you can go to. And next slide. And based on what your needs are, you can go jump to the talk, topic of your specific interest. This one is comparing state and financial policies. And so you'll see that in each one of these, we give you a case study along with the grades that it's uh, aiming to, that the audience is for, and then a link to the website. I think this is great for the sense that if you're not sure of what's happening in your own state or other states, this is a 
this is a resource guide that has a that basically compiles all of the promising practices and gives you an idea of what is happening at different states or what's happening at the local level and you can use this as an opportunity to connect with these programs or learn from them. Next slide. So now I want to switch my attention to educator resources that we've created. Next slide. Um, and this is our main page, as I mentioned to you, where you'll be able to find our, um, uh, our links to the uh, measurement guide and the building blocks research and the resource guide that I talked about. There's a link there on the bottom. But one thing that I do want to point out is that we're very proud of this. We recently released a set of teacher activities uh, that financial educators can use. And I don't want to scare you off in case you're not a teacher, so you're maybe thinking this is not useful for you. I think if you have any audience where you're working with young individuals, you can definitely adapt this for them. The great thing about these financial literacy activities is that you ha can sort by building blocks. So if you want to help them develop financial habits and norms, you can mark that. You can also sort it by school subject area. So let's say you are not a financial capability teacher, but you're maybe a math teacher and you want to incorporate this into your classroom. We have a bunch of different activities that's focused on that. In addition, you can search by topics, earning, saving, protecting, spending, borrowing, the grade level, the age range, and then the duration of the activity. So 30 minutes, 15 minutes, one hour. Next slide. So this is an example of one activity that we have. It's called distinguishing between credit and myths credit myths and realities. Uh, we have 11 different statements that you could post around the room. And the idea is to bring in the young folks that you're working with and they kind of look through the 11 different statements and they take base post-it notes and basically stick on each one of them whether or not they think it's a myth or a reality. And this is an opportunity for folks to engage and talk about why they believe certain things are the way or an opportunity to talk to them about why something that seems like a reality may actually be a myth. So a great way to create conversation in your classroom. Next slide. And finally, I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about our parent resources. Next slide. We have a, a website called Money As You Grow. Uh, and on Money As You Grow, you can find different activities for parents to have with their young children. So again, this is broken out by age group. It's very simple. All the activities is already on our website. You usually don't need to have anything extra except to print out the activity itself. And it takes the stress away from thinking about what should I talk to my children about. The other thing that uh, we also have is a Money As You Grow bookshelf program. These are about 12 different books that we you can get from your local library that talks about various money topics. And the idea is for you to go with your young child to the library to pick up one of these books. And we've created a parent companion guide for the books. So what you would do is read the book to the child and then afterwards use, utilize our companion guide to ask further questions to deepen their learning. It also proposes different activities that you can do around the house. Sometimes, in, sometimes it's activities like taking your child to go shopping with you or taking your child to go to a market with you to deepen the engagement. So we, I just want to point out that we'll be releasing uh, new titles to our Money As You Grow Bookshelf program later on this year, and we'll, um, some of these titles are also in Spanish as well. Next slide. So as I mentioned to you, if you're interested in any of these materials, this is a web page that you would want to go to. It's our Youth Financial Education web page. We've broken this down by consumer tools, practitioner tools, um, so you'll be able to find all of our research on there as well as the different programs that I talked about. There's a lot more that I'm not able to cover, so I, I hope you'll uh, go and visit. Next slide. And if you are interested, you're able to order any of our materials for free. We will ship them to you in bulk publication. This is our bulk, bulk publication page. You can go here to sort by the categories that you're looking to um, you're look, that you're looking for resources on and place an order and we will again ship these materials to you for free. And please know a lot of our materials are in different languages so if that's a population that you serve, uh, we definitely have resources there. Next slide. Is that it? Okay, I'm done. Great. 
Uh, thank you. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Jen Smith. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for having me, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I am going to be talking a little bit um, this afternoon about the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, and in particular, some youth financial literacy resources that have been developed um, because of that, uh, because of that act for the youth that we serve. Uh, next slide. So um, I, uh, so again, I'm Jen Smith, and I'm the Youth Build Program Director for. Um, for the Department of Labor, and I'm uh, housed in the Division of Youth Services. Um, and within the Division of Youth Services, we have three key programs, um, and I'm going to talk more about the first two, really, um, is where I'm going to focus, although all of these programs offer some um, financial literacy um, education and access um, through our programs. Uh, but the first is the uh, WIOA, or Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, Youth Formula Program. This is by far the biggest uh, youth serving program that we manage, and this goes to every state through uh, a formula uh, that determines the funding amount that goes to each state. And the idea for the youth formula program is that um, it's uh, focusing on youth, uh, in school youth ages 14 to 21, out of school youth ages 16 to 24, um, and providing a lot of workforce development, education uh, resources. Um, and uh, so I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the other big program that I want to talk about is the Youth Build Program, which is um, differently from the formula funded program, it is a competitive grant program. Um, organizations locally apply to get a Youth Build Grant Award. Um, but it is a program that serves out of school youth ages 16 to 24 and uh, focuses specifically on um, helping them to get their high school uh, credential or equivalence degree, um, as well as giving them training in both the construction industry and other in-demand industries locally. So um, I'm going to focus on those two programs. Next slide. Um, both of these programs were uh, reauthorized through the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, um, which was passed in 2014, and we began implementing it in 2015. Prior to the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, we had the Workforce Investment Act. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this slide, but I think there are some key things that I want to kind of highlight from um, how WIOA is, is different from how we focused um, on populations under WIA. With WIOA, it really increased the focus on serving out-of-school youth. Um, it was only 30% under WIA, and now 75% of funding has to go to serving out-of-school youth. Um, there's a big focus on work experience, naturally, being the Department of Labor. Um, I already mentioned the age uh, for in-school and out-of-school youth. But one of the key things that also happened under the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act is that it added five new required program elements to the Youth Formulas program. So um, program elements are required services that have to be provided to youth participants in the WIOA Youth Formula programs locally. Um, and, you know, there's some of the obvious ones you would expect, tutoring, alternative and secondary school services, um, occupational skills training, um, education concurrently in the context of workforce preparation, leadership development, mentoring, et cetera. Um, but these five new program elements, one of the key ones that was added with WIOA was the financial literacy education requirement, which means that now um, through the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, all of the WIOA youth formula programs are required to provide financial literacy training. And that was not a requirement prior to, um, to WIOA. IOA. So this has been a relatively newer area of work um, for us, um, and we've really been diving into this. Um, so next slide. Um, so just to give a little of the highlights of exactly what financial literacy education activities could look like under WIOA, um, it's uh, a pretty diverse range, everything from establishing bank accounts, budgeting, learning about credit, focusing on making informed financial decisions, and key issues of identity theft and the need to protect personal identity and financial data. Next slide. Um, one of the goals of making sure financial literacy education materials are targeted for the youth audience served by WIOA um, you know, means that it's also about making sure that financial literacy materials are available in multiple languages, that they're responsive to the learning needs of youth with disabilities, and that they're age appropriate and timely. Um, the goal of all this is to build financial capability in youth who may be receiving their first paychecks through WIOA programming. Um, many of the opportunities tied to the WIOA Youth Formula Program include um, the opportunity for paid work experience, summer jobs, year-round work experiences, um, et cetera. 
So uh, WIOA was really sort of that shift in thinking for us to realize that it, as a place where many youth may be getting the opportunity for the first paycheck, there's a responsibility to be to help them be accountable for that money and help them understand how to be financially capable. Next slide. So um, one thing that I wanted to highlight here is that um, the Employment and Training Administration um, has a, um, within the Department of Labor, has a web portal that we use for resource sharing with the public and practitioners. Um, the site is called Workforce GPS um, and can be located at www.workforcegps.org. Within Workforce GPS, there are a variety of communities of practice and resource collections, um, and I'm going to highlight two of them today. Um, this site that we're looking at, the screenshot from uh, right now, is the WIOA Youth Formula Program Community Practice, which is called Youth Connections. Um, they, within this community practice, they have many different resources, but they have specifically resource pages for each of the 14 required program elements. And so this snapshot is looking at the financial literacy education resource page. Um, content is continually added to this page as, as you know, made available. Um, uh, there are technical assistance resources that are developed for the Youth Formula Program um, organizations to use locally, helping them to understand about financial literacy and how to incorporate it into their program. Um, this also provides resources on curricula and training materials for financial literacy and capability, as well as some research and reports from some of, um, some of the partners that we're going to be hearing about today. Um, so there's a lot of great information on this page, and I would certainly encourage you to check it out. Next slide. So um, as I mentioned, the other program I'm going to talk a little bit about is the Youth Build Program. Um, the only uh, program that had a required program element for financial literacy education was the WIOA Youth Formula Program. However, some of the changes that took place with WIOA in terms of um, changing the uh, target populations that are being served in the formula program really um, help to better align it with the population that YouthBuild is already serving. So overall now, WIOA is more focused on an older out-of-school population um, with multiple barriers to, um, to employment success and, you know, um, uh, self-sufficiency. So um, both, to, you know, the Youth Formula Program and the YouthBuild Program, as well as our Reentry Employment Opportunities Program, where um, the programs that serve youth um, are focusing on youth who may have um, you know, uh, connections to justice system, uh, they may be foster youth, they're low income youth, um, so really we're, um, as well as being generally out of school youth. So we're looking at a population that really may not be getting any sort of access to financial information at home. Um, they may not come from a background of financial stability. Um, and so there's, you know, really um, a population that has a great need for, um, for financial literacy assistance. So in Youth Build, we also realized that we needed to adopt some of these behaviors um, and also that many of our programs um, of their own accord were already doing a lot of financial literacy work. But we wanted to get a better sense of the lay of the land of what the programs were doing. So in late 2016, we used our technical assistance provider to reach out to our programs and get a, an assessment of how, if they're using financial literacy training materials, how they're helping to support program, their um participants, excuse me, in the programs with financial capability, um, and just generally what that looked like, what sort of resources they were using, what the barriers were, um, and we got a lot of great feedback about, you know, their understanding of the importance and their responsibility for helping youth to understand financial literacy and helping to grow that capability, but it also highlighted some barriers that are, um, you know, maybe more specific to youth, and in particular, the opportunity youth that are served by uh, youth build programs. Next slide. So I wanted to give just a couple of highlights of what we found with that assessment that um, we thought were really sort of telling and interesting um, for the population we're serving, which again is uh, 16 to 24 year olds who are, um, have dropped out of school, um, do not have a high school diploma or equivalency, and again have multiple barriers, low income, offenders, um, <clears throat> could be a child of an incarcerated parent, a migrant youth, youth with a disability, um, or low income youth. Uh, or foster youth. I don't believe I mentioned that one. So uh, looking at that, um, some of the interesting things that we found out were we, you know, we'd asked a specific question around direct deposit um, simply because, um, you know, 
we feel like that's one strong financial practice that can lead to higher savings and more responsible spending habits. And youth build programs actually uh, generally provide stipends to youth while they're participating in the program, um, as well as sometimes actual wages while they're doing construction or other in-demand industry training. So that means, again, going back to this idea of helping them to be accountable because we may be the first place that they're getting access to, um, to steady, um, steady money. Uh, you know, a lot of the programs, because they're the ones paying the youth, we thought it would be interesting to find out how many programs are doing direct deposit. Interestingly, the majority of the programs are not doing direct deposit, um, which I kind of surprised us, to be quite honest. But um, a lot of them, you know, the reasons why had to do with just sort of their policies and practices related to um, direct deposit being used for employees or not having the right payroll system set up. Um, or, or sort of the cost of doing direct deposit. Um, and then also some of the issues that um, probably are no surprise to this audience were some of the barriers of not having a bank account um, or not having the right identification to get a bank account, um, not having any sort of credit history in some cases, or sometimes having um, a black mark because they had an account and had overdrafted, and so the account was uh, forced to be closed. Um, so those were interesting things that we started uh, seeing as, as barriers to the use of, of direct deposit. Next slide, please. Um, also, we asked our programs, if they encourage students to open bank or credit union accounts, how do they help them to do that? Um, we definitely saw some really positive things where that um, many of the programs um, have partnerships um, with local banks, or more often what we heard was with credit unions where they felt that the um, it was easier to have a, 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 they had a more flexible relationship with the youth and were willing to sort of work with the youth where they were in terms of their, um, their history and their identification and things like that. And a lot of them would have those partners come and provide the actual uh, financial training. Um, so we thought that was a great approach. Um, many of the programs um, actually also help youth to do savings by creating sort of a separate savings account for them where they kind of, uh, require that half of the stipend go into a savings account. Um, some of them provided incentives for saving um, and, you know, rewarded the participants for hitting particular savings um, milestones. Um, so those were some great practices that we saw. Next slide. Um, we also asked them generally about the types of financial programs that they offered um, and, you know, what they, what they liked or didn't like. Um, and we saw pretty diverse, you'll see here from the list, pretty diverse types of curriculum, everything from Money Smart, Banzai, National Endowment for Financial Education, Junior Achievement, MyPath, um, EverFi, Financial Literacy, all programs that um, are being used variously. Um, and then they also talked about other ways that they um, provided financial training, uh, sometimes in-house, like I said, having the bank or the credit union deliver some of that training. Um, or sometimes they even incorporated it into um, the contextualized learning. If they're doing, um, you know, math learning, they would sometimes try and incorporate into that some of the concepts of accounting or budgeting. Um, so they're kind of getting the learning in a more natural way. Next slide. So here was sort of our takeaway of some of the things that um, our programs found to be the most important lessons for managing money with the youth um, that they're working with. So I just think this is sort of a, a great um, a snapshot of, you know, what they sort of the, the pitfalls that they see youth getting into and how important it is to help them get out of those. The biggest one that we would hear with our youth is the importance of credit. Um, in some cases, some of these youth have actually had their credit damaged by their own parents who had opened accounts in their names um, and, then, and then hurt their credit. Um, so some of them are even coming in at a credit deficit before they've even really actually opened their own account. Um, a lot of the programs did try to work with banks to make sure that even if the youth was under 18, they could get a, um, an account that didn't have to be, you know, co-signed for by a parent, a non-custodial account. Um, that was a, a big thing that we saw. Um, but also, you know, predatory lending and some of those, the payday um, lenders and, and some of those bad behaviors that end up costing them in the long run. Those are a lot of the behaviors that our programs were really trying to undo, um, as well as helping, you know, participants to understand wants versus needs. I think that was a key thing that we also saw. So we found this to be a very helpful exercise. I mean, generally what we saw is that um, our programs were all doing some level of financial literacy, but they were approaching it in many different ways and sort of um, differing levels of involvement in terms of how much they're working closely with the youth. Um, but we really wanted to take that, um, those learnings, and, and put it into a technical assistance resource to kind of help our programs um, understand the lay of the land. So uh, next slide. 
Um, so these were some of the best practices that um, were shared with us um, by, um, by some of the programs that we thought were really, really interesting. Um, again, I think you'll see here, like, make the lessons real was similar to that idea that I talked about about incorporating it into actual learning, um, you know, making sure that they um, are kind of taking in the knowledge while they're doing, um, you know, math applications or things like that. Um, the online stock market game to help get these youth um, familiar with the idea of investing, something that they're probably really not seeing anywhere outside of um, this context. And again, I think that savings program for students um, has been a big one where some of the programs um, um, are implementing that practice. Uh, next slide, please. So the last thing that I really wanted to share here was just that um, this is the Youth Build community of practice. Um, again, this is another one of the communities of practice that exists on uh, Workforce GPS. Um, and what I'm showing here is the actual snapshot for the financial capability fact sheet that we developed last year um, for our grantees. And this was, as I said, sort of a, a um, sharing of the best practice strategies that we learned from, um, from the field, sharing about different kind of curriculas and sort of the plus and minuses of using those. Um, some of the barriers to youth and ways to sort of work around them. Um, and so this is a, a big resource that we've put forward recently. Um, we continue to share with our um, grantee organizations any sort of resources or information um, that is, you know, that is made available to us. Um, so we're really just, you know, focused on trying to get the word out about the importance of this, continuing to help programs access um, learnings and resources and information. And this is really sort of the way that we often share it is through our community of practice. Uh, next slide. So unfortunately, I uh, will not be able to stay until the very end of this webinar as I, I have a conflict. So I wanted to make sure that you had my contact information and would just recommend if anybody has questions or wants more information about any of um, the resources or the program elements um, or the communities of practice that I shared, um, please feel free to reach out to me directly uh, via email or phone. Uh, so I am now going to turn it over to Lucanne Anfani. Thanks, Jen. And we'll want to put it on the first slide for folks. Great. So my name is Lasana Pune. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing a few existing resources with you all. I'm a specialist in the Bureau's Office of Community Affairs. Um, I'll also be talking a little bit about some upcoming materials that I think would be useful for folks uh, on the call today coming out of our youth employment success work. So I'm glad I had the opportunity to go right after Jen because she provided some great context for that conversation. So I also have a disclaimer slide, just uh, stressing the point, um, but I'll, I'll leave it there for a second for folks. Just to give you all a bit of background, um, the office I'm representing today, Community Affairs, actually falls under the Consumer Engagement and Education Division. Um, our work primarily aims to help economically vulnerable consumers improve their financial well-being and achieve their financial goals. And what I always think is important to point out to folks is that um, economically vulnerable consumers aren't only those who are uh, low income. Uh, as many of you know, there are many people who may have sufficient income, but due to other circumstances or debt, they're often um, at risk of kind of losing that sense of economic stability uh, with just one family emergency or unexpected expense. So with that in mind, our work really serves um, a great deal of the public in America. And as a federal agency, it can often be difficult for us to reach consumers directly. So our office actually focuses a lot of our work through national and local agencies and organizations that are already trusted sources of information and support in their communities. So we reach consumers really where they already are. Um, we help build the capacity of these organizations to address the financial capability needs of the people they serve. So that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm excited to be on the webinar today, to, to speak with folks at community colleges. So what I'm going to start off by talking about is um, our youth employment success work. And this is a, a perfect kind of follow-up to Jen's background on, on some of the work that DOL is doing in this space. So uh, for the past five years, the Bureau has actually been working in the youth employment program space um, across the country to learn how we can continue to support the development of strong financial capability offerings. Um, and when we speak about financial capability here, it's important to note that we're, we're talking about the knowledge and practicing the financial skills, but we're also talking about access, uh, expanding access to financial products and resources so people really have the opportunity to really put those skills into action. 
And when we launched YES, um, we actually did that uh, with Jen's team, the Division of Youth. Uh, it's the Department of Labor. And we did that work from 2015 to 2017, working with 23 city programs across the country and doing some additional deep technical assistance for five cities, some of which uh, you all may be in, Nashville, Indianapolis, uh, in Vienna, Virginia, Boston, and Louisville. And as Jen mentioned, you know, the power of working with these programs is that we know that young adults taking on their first jobs, receiving their first paychecks are already building financial skills. They're already building financial habits. Um, they're already building relationships with financial services providers, whether that be banks or credit unions or uh, uh, payday lenders. And all of these practices are things that they're going to take with them throughout their lives. So we really have an opportunity here through these programs to provide them with the information and resources that can really help them start the, their financial lives on a stronger footing. So knowing that and knowing that um, DOL has really taken on um, a commitment to, to uh, uh, serving folks with more financial literacy materials, um, particularly that the fact that the WIOA formula funding um, serves these out-of-school, out-of-work youth who are ages 16 to 24, um, really gave us an opportunity there. So since it's a requirement for these programs to offer financial literacy resources, um, we're focusing a lot of our technical assistance and our work um, on those programs. Uh, and as Jen mentioned, a lot of these programs, the young people in these programs are often those most in need of work. Um, they may have experienced homelessness, be a part of the foster care or uh, juvenile justice system, or may otherwise be primary breadwinners in their homes. Um, and access to affordable financial products and skills around things like building a positive credit history or saving for expected and unexpected uh, expenses are really critical to their ability to achieve economic security. In the, the first iteration of this project, we really focused on providing these programs with our existing resources, um, really doing that work to help them embed them into their existing workflow, and also helping these programs build partnerships with financial institutions, similar to the ones Jen discussed, um, that work to offer accounts that would meet their needs, um, whether they be non-custodial accounts or accounts with um, fee structures that really suited folks who were just starting on um, their first jobs. So what I want to talk a little bit about here is our resource page, which we really built out uh, just last year um, as an opportunity for us to pull together these resources for folks that um, are kind of uh, existing on our resources as well as some of our partners. Uh, what you see here is the landing page, and you can see on the sidebar some of the additional resources from um, DOL, which uh, Jen spoke about, FDIC, and CUA, and some of our uh, bureau resources uh, from Youth Ed, which Mina spoke about earlier. Um, particularly, folks are interested in working with financial institutions to either offer financial products or improve the offerings they already have. Um, I think it's great to take a look at the expand access page you see there that you can link to. Um, it covers some regulatory and legal guides on offering accounts to minors, um, on offering payroll cards on uh, those pieces, but we also actually link to some a little more practical pieces. Um, for example, FDIC has a model safe account template. Uh, that template provides guidelines on features and fees uh, of what they identify as, quote, safe, low-cost transaction and saving accounts for underserved consumers. And what's really important about that piece is FDIC actually conducted a pilot study and found that these accounts um, that kind of use this template had a higher retention rate, meaning folks were able to stay in uh, those uh, programs, have those accounts for longer without having some of the issues that Jen spoke about, about people having to drop out or have those accounts closed on them. Um, but it, 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 was, it was actually about the same cost to the banks. So these tools are really uh, important for conversations that some of you all may want to have with financial institutions if you're thinking about um, ways that your program could be offering uh, accounts, savings, and transactional that work for the young people um, that, you're, that you're serving. We also have some information about payroll cards, um, and some of the resources that we have there might be helpful if um, you have some internal HR departments that are thinking about how to help your students access certain financial products. Um, they're also helpful when uh, you know folks have to deal with adjusting uh, kind of payroll systems in the way that Jen spoke of earlier in order to uh, serve young people more effectively. So uh, we also have that financial skills and knowledge page that you see on this landing page that is linked, um, and that really aggregates relevant bureau resources. 
Um, and some of those resources include worksheets that could help students do things like read their pay stub or understand their credit score, um, manage their checking account and the associated fees. So that you can, uh, of course, explore that at your leisure. But one thing that we're actually planning to do in the future, um, after having worked with uh, all of these programs through our technical assistance in the past several years, we heard from a lot of these programs that were, they were hoping for something a little more specific designed for young adults. Um, whether it be in the way that it's uh, interactive, online, um, and the way the language is kind of speaking to young people, and the way it's uh, addressing topics that are relevant specifically to them. A lot of the findings that you saw in um, Jen's uh, Youth Build report. And what we decided to do was uh, build out a, a tool that would really give people the chance to practice some of these skills um, by helping them to make an important financial decision that is relevant for uh, of many young workers, and I'm sure relevant to many of the folks you're working with. And that main trans, uh, de decision that we're talking about is transportation. So helping youth kind of address this concern, whether it means transportation to, to and from work, um, transportation um, to and from childcare, uh, transportation to and from uh, school or any programs that they're, they're taking part in, really helping uh, young people address this concern also gave us an opportunity to de delve into and help them practice some key financial topics that kind of surround this major decision. So uh, one topic that we'll be talking a bit about in that, that tool um, are transaction accounts. And that's really because young adults uh, who we're talking about are often uh, working and paying things like rent, utilities, child care costs, uh, as well as transportation costs. So access to a transactional account with account structures that work with for them can be critical to their access, help them make those payments. And we want to really provide an opportunity for them to think about whether a transactional account is a good option for them for managing their money and making those critical payments. On the other side of that, uh, we'll also be talking about savings. And when we're talking about savings in this case, um, what we're really thinking about is that while young adults um, that we're talking about often have multiple expenses and limited income, savings aren't necessarily completely unattainable. Um, so a lot of the work we're doing here includes supporting access to saving accounts, similar to what we were talking about before, um, helping people really understand um, the structures of the saving accounts options that are available to them, and identifying ways to help them regularly put money aside such as direct deposit or you know, regular reminders of progress towards saving goals that can really help them plan ahead. And then uh, one other piece that we'll be talking about is credit. Um, as Jen noted, that came up very uh, at the very top of some of the youth bill findings. And um, what's important there is that, um, that we find that um, for young people who we serve who are old enough to have a credit profile, they often have either thin credit files or none at all. As Jen mentioned, some folks are just pulling their credit report for the first time, um, just becoming eligible to pull it and finding there's already um, inconsistencies. So generally, we think it's really important for us to communicate to young people the true impact of their credit histories on their broader financial opportunity. So not only the opportunity to make transportation decisions like getting an auto loan, but things like identifying housing, attaining certain jobs, and um, really how to follow through with um, disputing any errors and handling any issues that they have with their credit reports and really beginning to build a stronger credit history. So I just wanted to give you a sneak peek of some of the things we'll be covering. Um, we're still in the early ages, so uh, early stages of building out the tool, so everybody Feel free to keep your eyes peeled for this tool in the coming year or so. Um, and I also wanted to take a little time to talk to you all about another set of resources the Office of Community Affairs offers that um, I think would be very relevant to the folks you are working with. And that's our Your Money, Your Goals materials. Um, you may be familiar with them, with them already. Um, all of the resources are available online. They can be downloaded for free or ordered for free. Um, and our materials also include slide decks uh, and other training materials so that you can train your staff or others on how to use them. Uh, you can go to the link on the screen if you want to explore, which I suggest you do because um, there are quite a few pieces that I won't be able to cover in this period of time. 
So Your Money, Your Goals resources were developed and designed to help staff of community organizations and entities begin to have these important money conversations with consumers. Uh, we've worked with organizations across the country to embed these tools into their work, and they've in integrated them in a lot of really creative ways through case management sessions, coaching sessions, uh, online lessons, and even um, adapted them into cr their teaching curriculums. So while the original toolkit, which we have a bit of a screenshot of some of the, uh, the toolkit at the very top of this page, um, that original toolkit was really designed to um, review a lot of key financial topics from budgeting to saving to credit to debt, and it includes many worksheets and scenarios to really help people practice at some of these the pieces of information. And they also, it also offers some guidance on how to broach these often sensitive topics. And so while folks are, are welcome to use the toolkit in its entirety, it's, it's meant to be used as a um, kind of pick and choose, pick your own adventure. When you see something, a topic that comes up during conversations with folks, you can flip to the appropriate section and really dig into that, that piece with folks. Um, but we actually also uh, got a piece of feedback in the early eight days of the Your Money, Your Goals work uh, from the field that certain communities have more specific financial challenges and opportunities that uh, are worth addressing. So in response, we developed three companion guides that can be used in tandem with the toolkit or even standalone. And these guides focus on three key populations that I'm sure many of you serve. They include native communities, uh, re-entry populations, and people with disabilities. And to just give you a quick idea of some of the really critical, tailored context that these guides provide, um, the People with Disabilities Guide, for example, covers topics such as paying for, an assist, paying for assistive technology. Um, and it also covers how to set up an ABLE account or achieving a better life experience account. Those are a type of savings products that are designed to offer people with disabilities an opportunity to save for some of their um, disabilities-related expenses while providing flexibility in how these savings affect their asset limits and Social Security benefits. So really critical information. It, it helps folks uh, review their ABLE accounts options and see if they're uh, eligible to open an ABLE account. Um, and that's something that I think uh, many folks aren't familiar with, uh, so it, it's, it's really critical that we, ha we have this information available. Similarly, our re-entry guide includes a debt tracker that specifically takes into account criminal debt and that acknowledges the kind of amplified consequences of unpaid debt for this population. So um, that really helps folks prioritize their debt and how they're going to address it. The guide also touches on things on, such as how to review a background screening report for errors to ensure that folks uh, don't have their op employment opportunities affected due to inaccurate or out-of-date information. Finally, I also wanted to talk a little bit about our newest set of Your Money, Your Goals resources. Uh, we decided that we really wanted to create less uh, expansive, more approachable materials that were issue-focused um, and in response, again, to things we were hearing uh, in the field. So we developed the Your Money, Your Goals booklets. They're, they're bright, they're interactive, um, they're meant to be used in paper format, but they can also be downloaded, as you can see in this picture on the bottom of the screen there. That's one of our, our, our booklets right there of the polar bear breaking through the wall of uh, bills. So they're bright, they're interactive, they include of a, uh, about uh, eight worksheets that focus on helping someone work through one financial topic. We have one called Behind on Bills, the one that you see on the screen there, and that focuses on budgeting and general money management. Uh, another called Debt Getting in Your Way, which, as you can uh, guess, reviews how to get organized and begin to address your debt. Um, and we also plan to release one on credit this year and another on savings the year after. And to give you guys a little bit of a look of what this actually looks like, I want to give you um, a quick sample. Uh, the debt booklet includes one credit tool in it, which I want to share with you all. But um, obviously, our credit booklet will go in much more depth into um, addressing credit. So here's kind of the front page, what you see on the right uh, of the screen here. And that's the front page of one of the tools. So what you see on there is the title, How Do I Check My Credit Report? Um, a kind of prompting, prompting question for somebody who may be working with somebody uh, on this tool. When was the last time you reviewed your credit report at the very bottom? Um, and then it, it covers what the tool will, will be discussing, getting a free copy of your credit report, understanding what's included, et cetera. So the way these tools are designed, you then 
unfold that one page. It, it's a trifold, and inside you find some kind of worksheet or uh, additional information. In this case, it provides you with three clear steps for checking your credit report uh, and some tips. First, getting your free copy of your credit report by going to the only federally authorized source for free credit reports, annualcreditreport.com. Um, and then the second page is uh, just about reviewing the information found there, some common errors you might find, um, what you should be looking for, why it's important to review um, these pieces. And then finally, a, a quick checklist that you can complete um, in order to make sure that you're uh, looking for specific things uh, that, that may be errors that uh, you may need to dispute. And then um, once you fold it back up, you see on the back page, uh, the what you see on the right side here, which is our, a step further page. And that page um, provides additional resources, uh, here a little more information on how you would go about disputing an error and uh, a template for, for submit that you may submit in order to dispute an error, an error with a bureau. Um, and really, this, this is just one example, and there are several of these on each of the pages, or for each of the booklets. So um, this is where I'm going to hop off and hand it off to our next presenter. I just want to note that as we continue to develop resources to improve the financial capability of both young adults and other economically vulnerable consumers, we're, we're open to learning from any organization that works with, with this population. Um, we also invite you to reach out to us if you'd like any to learn any more information about our resources. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Rachel Strawn. On. Hello, this is Rachel Strawn. I'm the program director of Great Expectations, which is Virginia's uh, program through the community colleges to help um, foster youth navigate um, higher education and get on to a self-sustaining career. Next slide. Next slide. But thank you. A little bit more about it. We um, we know that college education is the best way for a young person to gain independence, be that a post-secondary associate degree or a going on to a bachelor's degree or even a non-credit workforce degree that leads to um, fields like welding or nursing. We know that education um, leads to employment, and we try to improve the likelihood that young people will um, achieve their educational goal. We offer support as they finish high school, work through um, post-secondary education, and then transition beyond that. Next slide. So what we do, primarily we're a coaching program. We have coaches at 21 of Virginia's 23 community colleges, and they help with all the things that a parent might help a young person with um, in terms of post-secondary education, applying, figuring out what they're going to study, um, applying for financial aid, career exploration. Most of our coaches are um, career, career coach certified. Um, we try to get them prepared for jobs, either through internships um, or shadowing experiences, provide life skills training, mentoring opportunities, and then one of the biggest um, aspects of our coaches' role is connecting the young people to all the area resources be it housing, food, uh, transportation, social services. Next slide. So a little bit about why we're here. In 2008, um, folks in Virginia realized that we needed a solution to the high number of foster youth that were aging out of the foster care system in Virginia. We were number one in that. We had more youth aging out of the foster care system than any other state in the country. And these youth were, you know, not, um, going on to post-secondary education for the most part and um, not succeeding. This chart at the bottom kind of shows our program growth from 2008 when we had where we were at five colleges, um, 84 students till today when we we're at 21 and we serve about 1,400 students. Next slide. So I said there were, there were some conversations in Virginia about the need to help foster youth and these sort of started with um, Ann Holton, who was our former director and a former um, juvenile court judge and a former governor's wife, 
Um, our Chancellor, Glenn Dubois, who's still there, and then our fabulous donors, Mark and Barbara Freed. Mark has passed now. Barbara is still a donor and involved with the program. But I think Mark had a conversation with our Chancellor about um, how we had this high number of youth aging out of foster care and that the community college system that was kind of geared to help everyone, it wasn't necessarily really reaching this population. Um, so he challenged the chancellor. He said, I will donate a million dollars if you can raise four million more to do something to help with this problem in Virginia. And so um, that's how it began. And the reason why the chancellor is shown on with the with his bicycle is they went on a, uh, he went on a bike tour around Virginia to raise awareness and raise funds for the program. So that's how it began. It still is, um, Great Expectations is almost completely philanthropically supported in Virginia. Next slide. So this is just a graphic of where we are in Virginia. Like I said, we began at five colleges. The gold stars show um, where we are now at 21 of the 23. We're just, uh, there are two out in the Shenandoah Valley in the Roanoke area that we are not at yet. Next slide. And so I talked about how folks realized there was a need for something like that, and I'll give you a little bit of why, why there was a need. We know from um, a, a pretty comprehensive study called the Midwest Study of Adult Functioning of Former Foster Youth about the really difficult outcomes for young people who experience foster care. By the time that they're 20, age 26, almost 60% of these young people will have been incarcerated. Of the male population, it's 76%. And we know around 30% will be homeless or housing insecure at the age of 26, and that 60% will be relying on some type of public assistance. Next slide. And this, you know, these difficult outcomes are there, incarceration, and use of public assistance, um, homelessness, but also just earnings gap. When young people who experience foster care don't get to achieve the milestones in terms of post-secondary ed education that their peers do, at the age of 26, their peers are making an average of $32,000 a year, and young people who experience foster care are only making 13000 ish a year. So that's a huge difference, and we really are hoping in Virginia and trying very hard to um, narrow that gap. Next slide. What uh, the program was based on a model that came out of Casey Family Programs. It's a very comprehensive model, and we are um, trying to tackle all of these areas from um, designated leadership, which we have in all of our coaches, to financial aid, to academic advising, um, one of the areas that we're really working on now is right there at the top of the graphic, um, one that we really hadn't been able to address, which was housing and um, other basic needs. Uh, the community colleges as a whole are starting to have food pantries and the like, and we specifically, within Great Expectations, are trying to work on um, the housing piece, which is a, the biggest challenge for our youth. Next slide. So we do track um, performance measures to see how well we're doing with our, um, with our students. And these are the four we track, increasing the percent of students that graduate or retain the following term, the following year, how many we're um, serving in a potential pool. So we know in Virginia how many college-age foster youth there are. There's about 4,500. And so we're serving about 1,400 now. We hope to get to serve about half the population. We think that's a reasonable goal. We work on that, and then um, increasing the number of credentials earned each year, because obviously a credential is what leads to the job. Next slide. So these um, graphics just show how our students are persisting overall. So this is the fall to spring over time. Our, um, the students in the G program, even though they have, they're kind of the most at risk of all um, challenged populations, they are persisting in a, um, number very similar to their non-foster youth peers within the community college system, so we're pleased about that. Next slide. And then fall to fall is a more difficult measure. So these are the kids that were here in the fall. They maybe made it through to the spring, but a lot of them fall off over the summer or challenges come in the way, work or um, different life things get in the way. And so our persistence fall to fall again is in keeping with the general um, Virginia Community College population of about 48 to 50 percent. 
Next slide. And then our reach in Virginia. So we um, work with young people who are enrolled in classes currently. We work with young people who are trying to overcome barriers to enrollment. And that whole number this fall was around 1369. Um, and then we know how many college age foster youth in Virginia. And right now it's about 4,100. Next slide. And then graduates. This is a, a really uplifting graph to see. Because this is the number of graduates um, that we have within the program each year. And as you can see, it's growing over time. We're really proud of that. As more students we reach, the more students um, over time are gaining their credentials. And last year we had about 116 youth gain a workforce or associate degree or bachelor's degree. Next slide. And what this all um, means nationally is nationally if you were in um, foster care in America, you have about an 8% chance of ever getting, or about 8% of those students, I should say, ever get any kind of college degree, be it an associate degree or a bachelor's degree. But among the great expectations population, we're now at a 20% graduation rate, which we're really, really pleased about. And we hope to see that number grow even more over time. Next slide. And this is going to take us close to when we talk to the um, Virginia Department of Social Service um, folks in a couple of minutes. But um, one of the the ways we can help our students is through our Virginia tuition grant for former foster youth. Most of our students are Pell eligible, but if they're not eligible for the Pell grant, um, there's this other grant which will pay full community college tuition um, for those youth if, youth if they qualify. Next slide. And then a little offshoot of our program that we're really proud of and which is really um, helping us in Virginia is our leadership program. It's been our fifth year. We have a hybrid online in-person leadership training for our students. We have about 12 students that participate in this uh, leadership program. Um, they use a secret Facebook page, they use Blackboard, and they learn about leadership and advocacy online. And then in the spring, we gather them together um, for some in-person leadership training in conjunction with our graduation celebration. Next slide. And this is um, at our celebration. All of our leaders create adv advocacy projects, and they present these in post reform to our guests um, at this graduation celebration. It's a really fun day where we bring in all the graduates that can come from all over the state um, that got a credential that year. They come in with their coach, and we have a lunch and invite our donors and other interested um, supporters and we celebrate those graduates. So it's a great way to celebrate their success and to encourage those that are working toward um, their success. Next slide. This is a um, screenshot of all of our coaches at the different um, colleges with their contact information. Next slide. And that's it. That includes my contact information, and I'm happy to answer any questions after the regular program. Hi, this is Erin Kelly, and um, I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Youth Services Program Specialist at the Virginia Department of Social Services. I am going to piggyback on Dr. Strong's uh, presentation and just take a few moments to share some additional ways in which Virginia's foster care system offers post-secondary education support to youth. I would like to start by acknowledging the Virginia Department of Social Services appreciation for the Great Expectations Program. We are proud to partner with Great Expectations in the wonderful work that they do with youth who have experienced foster care in Virginia. As Dr. Strawn explained, youth who age out of foster care are an extremely vulnerable population who face a myriad of complex barriers to post-secondary educational attainment and their successful transition to adulthood. Great Expectations offers supports and services that can reduce or eliminate some of these barriers and we are grateful for the work that they do and the partnership we share to support this vulnerable population. No single system can solve these types of complex issues. Multi-pronged strategic actions and meaningful collaborations between systems, however, can and do have a positive impact. Next slide, please. 
The federal John H. Chafee Foster Care Program for Successful Transition to Adulthood Act provides states and tribes the opportunity to and responsibility of ensuring that youth who age out of foster care have additional supports and services in place to promote positive lifelong outcomes. One of the ways the Act does this is through the Education and Training Voucher, or ETV, program. The purpose of the ETV program is to fund goods and services designed to assist eligible youth in successfully completing a post-secondary educational or vocational training program. It provides up to $5,000 per year for up to five years in grant funding to youth who have aged out of foster care. These years do not have to be consecutive. So, for instance, a youth could complete a two-year degree, work for a couple of years, and then decide to return to school and be eligible to receive ETV again. Um, or, as Dr. Strong pointed out, a lot of our youth who participate in Great Expectations are going to be eligible for the federal Pell Grant. Um, and or the uh, Virginia Community College Tuition Assistance Grant. And so they actually may not have a need for, a, for the additional ETV funds at that time. If they complete their community college degree with the grants um, and scholarships that they need to pay for that and then move on to a four-year degree, they can begin using ETV at that time and continue it in a graduate level degree if they so choose. Next slide. The Virginia Department of Social Services operates as a state-supervised, locally-administered system, meaning that foster care services are provided at the local level, and that includes ETV. States and tribes who participate in this ETV program nationwide administer these funds in different ways. In Virginia, the funds are administered through the local Department of Social Services. So youth apply through their local department where they currently are or formerly were in foster care. Youth who are eligible are between the ages of 16 and 26. They have their high school diploma, GED, or equivalent, are attending an approved post-secondary educational institution or vocational training program, have completed the Virginia ETV application, have applied for federal financial aid, and maintain satisfactory academic progress. Next slide. ETV funds can be used to pay for such things as tuition and fees, room and board, textbooks, equipment, materials, supplies, tutoring, transportation, childcare, or other goods or services that are included in the total cost of attendance for the program they are participating in. Next slide. In addition to the ETV program, Virginia's local departments of social services are able to offer additional support. Fostering Futures is Virginia's extended foster care program for youth who would have otherwise aged out of the foster care system at 18. Fostering Futures allows youth to stay in foster care until their 21st birthday. This program provides living expenses and case management in partnership with the youth. Youth who choose to participate in Fostering Futures once they turn 18 must be going to school or working at least part-time or participating in activities that will reduce barriers to these. Attending community college and participating in the Great Expectations Program is an excellent way for youth to meet these requirements. Finally, additional Chafee Program funds, separate from ETV, are utilized to provide independent living services to youth. These, this flexible funding offers youth additional services, activities, and programs that support them in their successful transition to adulthood. These can include goods or services purchased for individual use, as well as group activities or workshops. For instance, a local department of social services may partner with their local credit union to host a financial literacy workshop for youth in foster care, and they can use these funds to help provide the materials, food, snacks, beverages for the workshop, or even incentives for youth who participate. By offering these multiple supports, we hope to provide youth with the opportunities that may need to reach their goals. Next slide. If there are any questions, please feel free to reach out directly to me or see our uh, youth-centered website, fostermyfuture.com. And with that, I will turn the floor back over to Bukala.
Thank you, Erin, and thank you so much to all of our speakers today for all of the information that you've shared. Um, before we open it up for questions, I just want to note that if you're wondering how you can get a copy of today's presentation, we will have it available on our website within a few weeks. The website is consumerfinance.gov, that's C-O-N-S-U-M-E-R-F-I-N-A-N-C-E.gov. You can also contact us via email if you want to receive additional information about this presentation. Our email address is cfpb underscore finex, that's F-I-N-E-X, at cfpb.gov. Now I will turn things over to our operator so that she can open it up for questions. If you do wish to ask a question over the phone lines, please hit star one on your phone. Make sure your phone's unmuted and please record your name clearly. Thank you. There are currently no questions in queue. Okay, great. Um, everyone has provided their contact information. If there are no questions today, um, feel free to reach out to any of the speakers directly. And again, thank you all to our speakers and our participants. Um, that concludes today's webinar. Thank you for joining today's conference. You may now disconnect at this time.